what I'd like to do now is to introduce Dave if he's if he's ready. Um, so Dave has been a um, select member for quite some time. Um, he's also been working with us on smart boards for, for, for a good number of years. So so we know we know Dave really well. And uh, if you if you want somewhere to go for your tax advice and your accounting advice, then uh, then he's a great place, a great, great place to go. And he's a, and and I've got a lot of time, a lot of respect for, for Dave. So do do listen to what he's what he's got to say, and also um, I think he'll probably talk about the fact that there's some uh, funded support that uh, that he can offer as well to either to any of us that might find it useful, or potentially to any of our any of our clients. So I'm going to hand over to to Dave now. So if I stop sharing, Dave, do you want to share your screen? Yeah. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. So, uh, yeah, th thanks, guys. A bit of background about what we do and what we're all about. So uh, the business is 10 years old um, next month, actually. So we started, my background was KPMG, uh, became a bean counter there, qualified bean counter and a uh, tax expert, then moved on to a company called Circ on the FTSE, so I was finance director there. And uh, I guess about 10 years ago, got to that stage where I thought there's more to life than the, the corporate BS, really, and all that goes with it. So we started from our kitchen table and uh, we're 10 people now, uh, and I say 10 years old. And about 450 clients uh, so uh, that's a bit of background about us we've got uh, clients all over the country all shapes and sizes all different sectors and spheres uh, and I guess the, there's two important things they want to know about their business uh, one what's their tax bill and how can they legitimately minimize that tax bill and do things differently potentially and also not too well about where they've been but all about making sure they've got sat enough for the future really well whether they be in 10 years time uh, next month next year or a better vision or sat enough for the future, really. Um, so if it's okay with everybody, I'd like to just cover um, three separate things today. Just do a bit of a recap over the last, um, I suppose, eight to nine months about what we've done for our clients, how we've helped them, uh, and how you can be helped also. Uh, a bit, if I don't mind, touch upon the upcoming budget on the 3rd of March, so literally about six or seven weeks away now, what my thoughts and predictions are there. And uh, just to let you know about some local support that's available in Worcestershire, uh, just just on a side note on that, we deal with clients as well over the country. We've got a client in Gateshead who works in this particular particular sector, and they're just amazed at how much support we get in Worcestershire, how much grants there are available, uh, business support generally uh, in terms of uh, help and guidance. Uh, you'll probably see when I come on to it, but there's a uh, there's coverage there for finance, IT, uh, cyber security, marketing, uh, green essentials. There's a, a whole coverage in terms of free business advice. Uh, and you'd be, be crazy, I guess, to uh, to kind of switch off and uh, not ignore that, really. Uh, so those two things, if that's okay, I won't harp on too much, but I think uh, if we go back and just look at my experience over the last 10 months, uh, quite amusing, to say to say the least, and also quite staggering. So what, what have we done over the last uh, 10 months? Supported our clients, really. Lots of pro bono work. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I've had clients in tears, uh, hysterical, in the wrong sectors, maybe hospitality, uh, leisure. And clients also flourishing through all of this, uh, winners and losers, I guess. Uh, but one thing they've all got in common is really they need to have some sort of direction of where they're going to. Uh, and we've helped them really uh, get their financial sat nav set. So all of our clients in the main are on something called Zero or maybe QuickBooks. Uh, so we're essentially making sure they've got the day-to-day uh, -day figures sorted uh, in terms of what their profit and loss is. But more importantly, uh, integrating with certain um, apps really one being um, fluidly the other one being spotlight so they know exactly where their uh, their sat nav is where their future might lie the next 12 months is all scoped out as a profit and loss account uh, balance sheet uh, and so on so they've got vision so we've helped them with all of that um, and essentially there's been lots of furlough payments you're probably all, you're probably all aware of this anyway but the furlough scheme runs to the end of april uh, my personal opinion is it'll be extended beyond that maybe to june but uh, we've done all of that for our clients uh, on a pro bono free basis really making sure they're supported uh, there's lots of things out there at the moment the bounce back loan most of our clients have taken on board just in case uh, government free money i guess for for 12 months no repayments needed uh, and clients have just taken that just in case really they can hand that back at a later date if they need to uh, within the first 12 months so a lot of clients have taken that and they've used that essentially to grow their businesses uh, push forward maybe it might be a new website it might be to invest in uh, new infrastructure. Uh, it might be to do some R&D. 
uh, but recreate the business. They've used that to uh, what it's been, meant for, really, being the bounce back. Uh, but one thing everyone has done or should have done is lent on their accountants or their FD. I mean, it's all about the numbers, really, business. It's great to have that marketing plan. But it's great to have the staff around you. But the one thing is cash is king, uh, turnovers, uh, you know, vanity and all of that. But it's all about the cash. So making sure your FD, if you're lucky to have enough to have one, your bookkeeper, your accountant, is helping you to demonstrate their, uh, I suppose, their uh, value, really. Making sure the, the figures... Uh, you know where you're going to, making sure you know where your tax bills are, your VAT, and also making sure you're leaning on the government. They've been very, very generous. I think Rishi's done a sterling job, um, and I think that also there's lots of ability there to defer VAT, um, there's the ability to defer VAT, um, tax, corporation tax, lots available, just making sure it's all forecasted for, and it's in your cash flow forecast. Uh, and clients have panicked a little bit, if I'm honest. They've had lots of things to worry about, uh, staffing issues, moving away from an office all i've really said to them is have one key figure or objective in mind and just concentrate on that it might be a turnover figure it might be a break-even point it might be the profit you need to make it might be making sure that website sort of just concentrate on one thing at a time make sure you nail it and get it done it's no good kind of trying to do four or five things and failing dismally just do one important thing and make sure that uh, you nail it and achieve it and all I'd say is do one positive thing each day. It might be attending a course like this, talking to Kevin, uh, potentially reading a listening to a podcast, reading a, a, a you know technical art, a, a article, speaking to staff. But just do one positive thing every day uh, that makes you spurs you on really and gets you in that sort of mindset. And I think Andrew Barry touched upon it. A big thing for me really has been that physical exercise, making sure that obviously we work our uh, our derriers off for our clients, but main, at the same time, look after ourselves, make sure we're getting out for a run, uh, spending some time with the family, just a bit of, a bit away from the laptop, really, and the computer. And it's uh, it's dangerous, I think, in this, uh, this day and age where we're all working from home and that could creep into living at work. So it's just making sure we've got our boundaries set out. We don't rely too much upon, uh, you know, kind of getting obsessed by work, really. So that's where it's been. So for the last 10 months, grueling really, we've all worked hard, we've all battened down. But off the back of that, I think it's been a great time to be in business cynically. People have had to think on their toes, uh, think around the box. And I think the biggest thing I've noticed is the amount of uh, clients that are reinventing themselves. And that's a testament to things like research and development tax credits, whereby they've done things differently. And the government are incentivising them to enable them to be able to, to get tax benefits for doing something differently, joining software, for example having an improvement process in place, uh, being innovative. So that's uh, that's a bit of background where we've been in the past year. We've got a budget coming up in probably six to seven weeks' time, and there's been a lot of speculation about the fact that the government have coughed out trillions of uh, support for us all and how that's going to be paid back. It could be a bit of a pump, but I think personally uh, there's another round of quantitative easing to come forward from the government. I think also they've borrowed trillions and billions and I think taxing us heavily, certainly over the next 12 to 24 months, isn't the way to go. They've borrowed staggering amounts and I think we're going to flourish, there's no doubt about it. Vaccinations will roll out. Everyone's going to be okay at the end of the day. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard where we are now to kind of see beyond that. But spring 2022, beyond that, things will get better. And we're all going to be buoyant again and things are going to, in my opinion, bounce back. And that will really create inflation. And I think what the government are hoping or what will happen is the trillions of amounts worth of debt they've borrowed will be inflated away gradually. Uh, it won't be our problem necessarily. It will be our children's and grandchildren's, and, and unfortunately. But I think over the period of time, that debt will be deflated. And I think the worst thing Rishi can do in March is start to say, right, let's hammer individuals. Let's start increasing corporation tax. Let's put stamp duty up. Let's uh, attack capital gains tax. I think there might be a little bit of that in terms of expectations going forward. I think ultimately it's going to be a giveaway budget. I think I can see the furlough being extended. I can see more support for house builders. There's a there's a question mark I read over the weekend in the Sunday Times where they scrapped stamp duty and merged with the council tax. And I think there's a big debate at the moment today about whether stamp duty is kind of extending the stamp duty holiday uh, for another three months. So I think he's going to look at it sensibly and I think he's going to put more stimulus in place and take us forward. And in due course, obviously, inevitably, the tax rises will come. But I think they're 12 to 24 months down the line. Uh, so that's my kind of uh, input into the whole thing, really, for what it's worth. Um, he's doing a sterling job, and I think he'll continue to do that, supporting businesses by giving us encouragement to, to move forward, really, and grow the economy and grow the UK generally. 
So moving on, really, as I say, speaking to people outside of our particular county, we're very, very well blessed in terms of what's being available. And there's two things we've been looking to uh, being accepted for. So we're, we're, we're involved in two programmes. First and foremost, the Here to Help Business Adapt. That's through Worcestershire County Council. And there's three elements to that. So the support for IT, the support for marketing, and the support for finance. So you'd be crazy, in my opinion, to pay for advice when it's freely available. Uh, initially, there's three, three, three hour sessions to talk to an expert in those certain areas in any realm of that particular support you might need. And then beyond that, and then if you've really got a, 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 a massive need for support, there's up to six days worth of support in any of those areas, which is massive. We've got clients at the moment asking for R&D support, uh, cash flow forecasting, uh, reviewing their taxes, even bookkeeping support and help with that. So there's nothing it doesn't cover. Uh, and I guess the same way with the marketing, really, if, you, if you want to put a marketing plan together, or you've got issues with social media or your strategy generally, uh, there's available help there. So uh, you'd be crazy not to look at it, consider it and put an application form in, uh, in my opinion. And off the back of that, really, there's been a, a recently announced uh, the launch of Worcestershire Business Central. So Kevin's involved massively in what's called the peer networks. And I know he's presented, I think it was last week or the week before, with Mark Wright on that. And that's the gateway, in my opinion. So it's all about, in my opinion, being surrounded by good people. And that runs off the back of the peer networks. And then when you know what the good people are and what you need, then you can go to the marketing gurus, you can go to the IT experts, the finance people, etc. Uh, and there's been a big push by which is Business Central to be able to give support to the right businesses that are growing and need that support. And again, there's four or five sectors. I know there's IT, there's general business advice, there's marketing, uh, there's finance, and there's also anyone who associate with green credentials to have help in all of those certain areas. Again, free support, uh, up to half a day, I think, per session, I think a maximum of one day. Uh, so lots to go at, really. So if you're not, you know, apply for both. Uh, the one difference is that Worcestershire Business Central, they apply to B2C businesses rather than B2B. I know a big criticism my clients have is there's lots of support at their day for B2B businesses, but I'm a B2C business. And the Worcestershire Business Central support applies applicably to uh, B2C businesses. So if you are a B2C business, maybe have a look at that. I can send out the links after, a, after this meeting or Kevin can just to uh, see, see how you apply for those, uh, those grants and uh, that support really. And also to, men to mention also uh, grants sustain and grow. And that again is a 50% grant towards uh, growing the business. It might be capital equipment. It might be a new website marketing yourself. But again, not to be sniffed at, worth going for. It. And I, I think in my opinion, if you're going to go for 500 pound and you can afford to go for 5,000, it's the same amount of work involved. So, you know, get all your ducks in a row. Think about what you need over the next 12 months. Uh, draw a list together and essentially go forward and uh, put all that together and get a grant for the full, for, full kit and caboodle. Uh, that's what I'll be promoting really. So lots to go at. Uh, we're very lucky in this uh, particular uh, county, in my opinion, and what's out there. Uh, and I think surround yourself with good people. There's plenty of support and help. So uh, yeah, you just get stuck in really. That's what I'll be saying. And, uh, you know, and uh, supporting Kevin in the, the, peer to peer, the peer networks as well. Uh, surround yourself with good people and just collaborate uh, and get stuck in. Uh, and one thing I suppose I have learned over the last um, 12, 12 months really is just uh, be positive and uh, aim for the sky and, um, you know, everything else seems to work out, hopefully. And that's about it, Kevin, for me. Very good. Thank you very much, Dave. <coughs> really, really good. So um, any any questions? Anybody got any questions for Dave? What I'd like to do now is to introduce Juliet Barrett. Um, delighted that Juliet's been able to join us today. Um, Julia was introduced to us by by Hannah, so thank you very much to to Hannah Hatfield and Make More Noise PR for 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 inviting Julia along. Um, so Julia is the co-founder of Grenade, um, who are now one of, if not the leading innovators in in wider lifestyle and what might be called the sort of the active nutrition space and and they've got global awareness they're renowned globally for their product range which includes things like carb killer bars and shakes um, and thermo detonator so some great great brand names there so i'm really looking forward to hearing about uh, about the rest of the rest of the story and I, I know juliet's got some really extensive experience so juliet if i can maybe just hand over 
straight to you, but welcome and thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. I was just looking at that picture thinking, I can't blame lockdown for looking feral because I looked feral then. So <laughs> maybe it's just me. But anyway, more important things. Um, thank you for the opportunity to talk about the grenade story. Um, I do talk really quickly, so I promise that I won't bang on for too long. Um, and I'm sure that if I do that, there'll be some technical glitch and everything will go very quiet and black screens. Um, I've got a very sort of traditional background. So I went to school, university, qualified as a teacher, um, was probably the worst teacher out there. Um, never really sort of wanted to do it. It was one of those things where I did a generic geography degree and then sort of went into teaching because I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, so I taught in a school, went into a sixth form college, went back into a school as a head of sixth form, and then went and worked for the Learning and Skills Council, widening participation for like 14 to 16 year olds in vocational training. Um, I then moved away from the sort of training into um, the charity sector and was the head of education for ROSPA, which is the accident charity. Um, and then in Birmingham on a very drunk night out, I met Al, um, my partner who I founded Grenade with. So Al had a sports distribution business. So he was selling um, sports products to gyms in the sort of Birmingham area. So I worked for ROSPA for sort of three years, realized that you know, we had a very sort of complementary skill set. He was very much sort of product focused, MPD, whereas I was very much into branding and marketing and what things look like. Um, so I went to work in his sports distribution business where we sort of imported products, protein products primarily from the US and sold them to gyms in, in the Birmingham area. And I think it was during this time, which was sort of 2006, 2007, that we realized that sort of sports nutrition, and for any of you that aren't aware, sports nutrition primarily are like sort of protein products that used to be sold in gyms, you know, the big sort of tubs of powder um, that helped you perform better in a gym. So it was like protein products. It could have been like flapjacks to give you energy, like carbohydrates. It could have been recovery products. But it was still, it was a very niche industry. So it was used by athletes that took training seriously, that wanted to get better at what they did. Um, and it was still quite a small market. And what we realized very early on, so sort of back in 2008, is that all the products out there were very generic. So everything was sold in a white tub. Everything had a very sort of scientific name. So at that particular time, products were called things like Xenadrine, Zedracut, Hydroxycut. And actually people couldn't remember what they were called when they stepped outside of the gym. So we realized that we could do something better than everyone else was doing, or not better, because that sounds a bit arrogant and we're definitely not arrogant, but differently. So we decided that we wanted to launch a sports nutrition brand ourselves, but we wanted a global brand and we wanted it to be very distinctive. So it didn't matter where you were in the world, what language you spoke, you would know what that product was called by the look and feel of it. So we had a friend that had um, a tool making business in Birmingham. He wasn't doing very well. In fact, he was nearly ready to close the doors. And we went to see him one day and we said, Keith, can you make us a, a container, a plastic pot in a grenade shape? And he said, well, yes, you know, I'll have a look at it. So he developed this tool. We spent, I think it was about 27,000 pounds. So very, very early on in the business, it was a huge chunk of money to put into it to make this grenade shaped tool so that our packaging would be very, very distinctive. So we started protecting the IP for grenade back in 2006. We then spent money investing in the tooling. We had great contacts from our sports distribution business. So we knew a lot of the wholesalers. And then sort of, I think it was sort of August, 2009, we incorporated grenade. We got product ready and we launched our first product in the UK in February, 2010. And what we wanted, we realized that everyone at some point in their lives wanted to lose weight. So we thought we didn't want to go down the protein powder route because it was commodity and it was very sort of price sensitive. So we wanted to launch a weight loss product because we realized that actually if you took something and you felt it and you felt it working, then you would probably want to take it again. So we knew a guy in Canada that worked with a big sort of vitamin supplement brand that helped us with the formulas. And again, you know, when it comes to sort of weight loss products or thermogenics, they're called, there, are, there aren't really any sort of miracle ingredients. So it was all about the branding. We used high quality ingredients. So the product had things like caffeine, green tea, green coffee, and they were all really good quality ingredients. But there was nothing that anyone was doing that was, you know, really out there. So we knew that we needed to have a product that one had a name that stood out and also we marketed it really well. 
So in 2010, February 2010, we launched our first product in the, to the UK, which was a weight loss product called Thermodetonator in a grenade shaped container. And when we set up Grenade, we said, well, you know, we work really hard. We want to sort of retire almost. We want to be able to do it from wherever we were in the world. And I remember sitting in Florida on holiday, launching Thermodetonator into the UK market. And there were two sort of websites, wholesalers that we went to. One was CLF, which is based in uh, the Southwest. And one was Tropicana, which was based in Birmingham. And both of them have got online portals. And we logged into these portals on the 10th when we launched. And we were literally looking at it, refreshing it, you know, the legendary F five button you know refresh refresh and nothing was selling and excuse my language we thought shit you know we've made a massive mistake here we put all this money into developing this brand um and it's not selling so we realized very quickly that we needed to come back to the uk and we needed to make it sell so i think when i talk about grenade i always say it was a hobby that turned into an obsession because when we set out, we wanted to deal with as few people as possible, hence why we went to the distributors. And we wanted it to be a bit of a hobby that we could do when we were away and, and you know, when we were traveling. But it actually turned into an obsession. So this idea that we would just sort of do a little bit of it never really happened. And before we knew it, you know, we were working 24-7. We'd set up an office at home. Um, you know, there were just the two of us. And we thought, right, we've got to give this a really good go. So just after we launched, we started to do all the trade shows. We started to do all the trade advertising. Um, people always say, you know, what was it that made Grenade great? And actually, there was no one thing. It was just doing everything. So, you know, um, social media was just starting to take off. So we started to build our Facebook and our Instagram, but it was nothing like it is now. Um, our big sort of moment really was Body Power in 2010 in May, which was a big health and fitness show in, at the NEC in Birmingham. And like I said, you know, we were a really small company then. We hadn't actually sold many products, but we knew we needed to be visible there. We didn't have the budgets of the other brands. So instead we hired a tank. Well, we've got a friend that's got a private collection of like a hundred and so tanks based down in Northampton. And we thought, Do you know what, sod it. We drove a tank into the NEC and that was our booth. And like this tank was driven on like, I think it was fueled by cooking oil and God knows what else. And like the smoke and the noise and the flooring at the NEC was just a complete mess. But basically we stood there with a couple of pull up banners and that was our booth. But because it was so different, it really stood out and it did get the attention of not only the consumers, but also of some of the big retailers. And I never forget, you know, they're almost like sort of defining moments when you start a business. And at the end of May, I was standing on the train station at Soli Hull, um, waiting to go into, into Birmingham with my mum. And I got an email from the health and wellness bar at GNC in the US. And he was like, oh, I saw your product at the trade show in Birmingham and I'd really like to stock it. And that was really the point where we thought, you know what, we've got something here. Um, but like I said, you know, I think you do need an element of luck when you grow a business, but you need to have everything else as well. So we've got like a lot of determination. We had faith in the product. We had a great product. We had a great look at the product and we did everything. So we started to work really hard on building a team of athletes because when it comes to sort of weight loss and sports supplements, a lot of the brands out there are quite gimmicky. And I think because our product looked gimmicky, it looked like a toy because it was in like a plastic container shaped like a grenade. We had to work extra hard to make it credible. So instead of just getting people, you know, that have got big boobs and, you know, great faces to stand there and promote our product, we decided that we wanted to use credible athletes. And actually, we changed the face of sports nutrition in the UK because prior to Grenade, everyone was using, like, I always say big men small pants. So they had, like, big men standing there holding tubs of protein, whereas we wanted to go for more of, like, the men's health look. So very much a fitness look. Blokes want to look like it, girls want their partners to look like it. So we built a team of credible athletes. And like I said, it was just the start of social media. So these athletes started to talk to their clients. They started to post posts on Facebook and, and Instagram. And that was really what built the credibility of Grenade. And to this day, you know, the one thing that's been really important to us is that we never want to mislead anyone. So even though the product looked quite gimmicky, there was sort of credible science behind it, you know, university test ingredients, et cetera, et cetera. And we never claimed to be a miracle weight loss product. It was always something that helped you with or helped you with elements of weight loss. So caffeine gives you energy, et cetera, et cetera. So we never wanted to mislead anyone. I think that's really important now when you're building a brand is that especially I think when it's a food business and people are ingesting your product, you've got to build that trust with them and that relationship and, you know, that one bad review or something that goes wrong can really be damaging a brand. So, you know, we always wanted to talk directly to our consumers. 
So that was sort of 2010 when we launched the first product. Um, because the product looked quite gimmicky, we did need to have another product in the range as well. So we really started off wanting to be like the Red Bull of sports nutrition. We wanted one product that worked, that sold and people understood. And, and that was the only thing that they bought. But we did get asked for other products. So between sort of 2010 and 2014, we bought a range of sports nutrition products out. So we had like pre-workouts, we started to go into protein. Um, with regard to growth and sales, we started to get listings in some of the big sort of UK retail. So Holland and Barrett was one of our first customers. We were in all the gyms and the specialist health stores. Um, but it was in sort of 2013, I think, that we got an email from Tesco's and Tesco said, we can't ignore you anymore. And that was really one of the big steps for Grenade as a brand, because to make a successful business, you need great products, but you also need luck and timing. And it was at this time that actually sports nutrition was becoming a bit more mainstream. So healthy living, people wanting to look after themselves, going to the gym was becoming more of a sort of lifestyle choice. So I think it was at this point that some of the UK retailers realized that actually we need to have sports nutrition in our stores to keep our customers happy. Hence why they wanted to stop grenade thermodetonator. So that was a big sort of step change for the brand because it took us out of sports nutrition niche into sort of mass market UK grocery. Um, through sort of 2011 to 2014, we started selling internationally as well. So we had sort of UK uh, retail, we had sort of retailers in Europe, we did some of the European trade shows. We launched our product in GNC in the US. Uh, that was in August 2011. And actually, even though for us, that was great, you know, we said, oh, brilliant, you know, we've made it in the US. We hadn't actually nearly finished the brand because even though we got product on shelf, you know, we didn't sell because we didn't market. And like, if you don't sell stuff in GNC in the US, you have to pay not only, you know, refund them their money, but you have to pay to take it back as well. So actually we did go internationally a little bit too early. We should have really built the brand in the UK first and then rolled that out. So, you know, people always say, you know, is there one thing that you regret doing with Grenade, the business? And actually don't regret doing it because, you know, we worked it out and it all worked out fine in the end. But in hindsight, I think we would have grown a bit more strategically. But as an entrepreneurial business, when you say somebody, when somebody says they want your product, you want to give it to them. So we always said yes, as opposed to, well, actually, yes, but maybe in six months time. Um, we had our first round of investment from Grove Point Capital in 2014. And I remember them saying, oh, we invested in Al and Jules and four cats because really the business was so small. So there were two of us. I think we had a girl as an office manager, my friend from the gym. And I think we had a guy that sort of just come out of university that helped us with some of the operational stuff, but it was such a small team. And in 2014, we got investment valued the business at 80 million, but it was very much a sports nutrition brand. Um, now, Grove Point Capital, great guys, pseudo private equity. So they weren't very hands on. The business was growing nicely. The market was growing. Um, they encouraged us to take on a, a financial um, a finance director, which was actually the best hire that we ever made. Because again, as an entrepreneurial, an entrepreneurial business, spending sort of 80, 100K on a, a member of staff at that particular point in the business was a huge investment. But actually, Tom, you know, is, is a brilliant guy, still in the business now, a great friend. You know, he's got equity now as well. And that actually did free Al and I up to do the things that we were really good at doing, which was going off and, and selling the brands. Um, 2015 was a huge sort of change in the business. Um, we realized that sports nutrition was probably becoming more mainstream and actually selling big tubs of protein or fat burner products in UK grocery wasn't necessarily the way it was going to go. So healthy snacking was becoming really, really popular. People wanted an on the go protein snack. They wanted something that had protein in, but didn't have much sugar in, but tasted great. So we spent probably about 18 months trying to come up with a chocolate bar, like a protein bar called Carb Killer, that tasted like a proper chocolate bar. So we launched Carb Killer in 2015 in April. Um, this was variant 27. So it took us 26 goes um, of failures, as we always call them, to get the product right. And again, you know, we could have launched probably a year earlier, but it wouldn't have been the right product. And for us, it was really important to get the right product. 
And I think launching Carb Killer was the biggest step change in the business because actually it gave us something to go and offer to UK retail because it tasted so good. It stood out from the other protein bars. We went to a chocolate manufacturer as opposed to a protein manufacturer because the taste was so important to us because actually we thought life is so short, you don't want to compromise on taste. And we knew that people wouldn't pay £2.50 for a chocolate bar if it tasted awful. So when we launched Carb Killer, we got interest from Tesco's again. We went into Sainsbury's, Asda, um, Holland and Barrett. Um, so all UK retail. Um, we also got interest from a lot of the convenience sites, so petrol stations, gas stations. Um, and actually Carb Killer was the one thing that made us mass market. And we always say to build a successful brand, you not only need a good product, you need availability and you also need demand. So we created the demand online with social media and actually without sounding too sort of stereotypical, the biggest growth for Grenade and Carb Killer was women on Instagram because women had found a chocolate bar that they loved that they wanted to share with their friends. So, you know, it was a very sort of photographic, you know, photogenic product. It looked really good. Um, so a lot of women were sharing it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so we got listed across all sort of UK FMCG, so all the big sort of retail giants. We we're also selling internationally. It was at this sort of point, sort of 2015, 16, that we realised that actually we needed to replicate what we've done in the UK but overseas. So we started an office in the Middle East because that was a big market for us. We started to get um, a team on the ground in the US as well. Um, we sent a guy over to India because that was a growing market for us as well. So we realized that actually to grow in these regions, we needed to have people on the ground over there. Um, our second round of investment was from Lion Capital. That was in 2017. Bearing in mind now we had, we were more of an FMCG brand. So we were actually changing the confectionery market in UK retail. And actually the confectionery market is a market that hasn't really been disrupted for years. So you've had the same, you know, brands of chocolate bar, you know, the Nestle, the Mars, um, you know, the Cadbury's on the shelves. They bring out different variants, but there's re really been no sort of innovation. And protein in chocolate was a big sort of, a, a big jump. And we were going into the supermarkets and they were listing us next to the confectionery products in the confectionery aisle, which was a huge sort of jump for us because before that we'd always been in sort of specialist sports nutrition aisles. So we had investment from Lion Capital and um, they invest in a lot of sort of consumer brands, GHD Hair Straighteners, Jimmy Choo, they've got jewellery brands, um, All Saints clothing brand. And they invested in 2017 at 72 million. Um, again, you know, because the business was growing, they were very hands off. They did encourage us to grow the team. And again, as an entre entrepreneurial business, you think you can do everything yourselves, but actually bringing on good people at the right time is the best thing that you can do because they do help you grow the business. And I always said that, you know, with a good team around you, the highs are higher and the lows aren't as low because you've got that support. Um, and again, you know, it meant that Al, can, Al and I could go off and sell the brand. We could focus on the marketing. And, you know, well, one thing that sets Grenade apart from a lot of the other sports nutrition brands is because the founders were so involved with the growth of the business, we wanted to have fun with it. And, you know, a lot of our personality, which is a bit weird, are in a lot of the products that we do. So whereas other people would spend sort of tens of thousands of pounds on like trade shows, you know, we drove the tank through London. We made sure that, you know, we, we you know, everyone shared the post. We got some um, really credible athletes athletes on board you know we got some influencers on board and we wanted to have fun with the brand and that was really really important to us I think the latest thing is that we've just launched a grenade hot air balloon that's been flying around like in the shape of a, a grenade thermodetonator and you know we campaigned against keeping the gyms open during lockdown and you know we're really passionate about what we do and we never wanted to lose that and I think one of the biggest challenges for a growing brand is that how you keep that sort of DNA you know, how you keep consumers in the business and you don't become a big sort of faceless corporate, which is, you know, which is, which is quite challenging. Um, so, you know, we grew the staff to two over 60. We moved more into UK retail, convenience, you know, we're in convenience stores overseas as well. Um, but I think it got to the end of 2018, you know, the business was eight years old. And I realized that actually, you know, for me as a sort of founder and a marketeer, it was time for me to sort of step away from the day to day because it had become a business with private equity that was a lot more about the numbers and less about the brands. And, you know, as I was saying to you earlier, it was quite difficult because it was always like someone was criticizing your child. 
and saying, you know, should you do this? Should you do that? And, you know, I haven't got kids, but Grenade was my baby. So I thought that actually it was the right time for me to step away from the business in, in 2018. So what I'm up to now is I work with a lot of other sort of SMEs, um, mostly in the sort of food and drink space. So I work with a vegan chocolate brand that based up in, in Altrincham. Um, we've done a rebrand, you know, we're just getting listings in all the sort of UK grocery chains. You know, sales have gone from 300,000 turnover to like I think just about 1.3, which is phenomenal growth. Um, I work for a company that does um, tortilla chips, like vegan tortilla chips. So again, in the food and drink space, Space. and it's just really exciting because it's at that stage of a business where the businesses are growing and they just need that little bit of guidance or more of that sense check really about employing people and talking to retailers and you know you do get a lot back from that so that's sort of really exciting for me I think COVID has been a massive challenge obviously but because you know the majority of the bands and uh, brands are food and drink and um, there's still a demand for that but there are challenges around communication customer service getting in touch with the buyers but I think it's a real sort of good opportunity for brands now to grow and sort of being smaller businesses, you're a lot more agile and you can sort of make changes quickly without having to go through a board or, you know, a lot of paperwork. And I think that really, you know, you mentioned it was only a very sort of small percentage of UK businesses that have got above sort of 50, 60 staff. And, you know, I think that's what makes British business great. The fact that we've got this whole army of sort of small businesses that are, that are doing stuff that they love doing and doing it really well, employing three or four people and just growing in those sort of niche industries. Um, so I think it's a really exciting time for British business and you know we launched Grenade back in a recession and people always say you know why did you launch then well it was almost like well we wanted to launch and it just happened to be in a recession so we could have waited a couple of years but for us it was almost like well we'll make the best of the situation that we're in and actually you know when times are tough apart from at the moment obviously because we can't go to the gyms people not, haven't got the money to go out but they do want to look after themselves so they do go to the gyms and they do sort of watch what they eat so actually even though we were in a recession it was quite a good time for the business um so that's it really um i know i've sort of rambled on no slides so i apologize for that but i hope that gives you a taste of grenade where it started and, and where it is now that's fantastic. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Juliet. Some really good, really, really good uh, insights in, in, in there, actually. And um, um, yeah, some, some really, really nice specific points. Uh, anybody got any, any, any burning questions? Yep, Jenny. Oh, put your hand up, so I'm sure. Sorry, I was just brushing my hair. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a question, but I can't wait to try the carb killer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my member of staff behind me has just said, I'm a client buys Grenade products. She's a personal fitness trainer. So you Thank interviewed her, Kev, you know, Amy. She, uh, yes. I said, right, I really like the sound of something that tastes like chocolate that's actually quite good for me. So I'm going straight on the website after. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I have to say, I have a friend who's a personal trainer and she goes completely nuts when she can't get hold of her carb killers. Very good. Doug, yes, you got your got a question, I think. You're on mute though. All right, my mouse went to sleep as well, so that didn't help. <laughs> um, okay, a uh, yeah, just thinking of when you started out and you said you you used um, social media um, or you set up in the early days of social media, were you looking at, at paid ads then to try and boost it or did you just grow it organically? No, we grew it organically. I think, you know, back in, like I said, you know, that would have been sort of 2010. It was very sort of early days and every penny counted. And like, we didn't really know. I mean, we're not e-com people at all. You know, we were very much bricks and mortar and sort of talking to people and building a brand like that. So it was very, very organic. And we didn't actually start paying for adverts until probably, you know, we never sponsored people until maybe sort of three, four years ago. So yeah. it's all been relatively recent, but obviously now, you know, with the business as it is, then there is a lot more sort of inter, interpaid ad, adverts. Mm. But again, yeah. like, you know, because it's a food business as well, we wanted to be very genuine. So I think sometimes when you push stuff and it's paid and it seems very promotional, then that does put people off. I know it's slightly different now, but for us, it was almost like we only wanted people that genuinely like the product and use the product to actually talk about it. How did you get that you got them to actually follow you or just by getting them to join into things? Uh, it was very much like free products. 
so we gave people products to test and we, you know, encouraged them. We built like a, we always used to call it like the grenade army. So a team of people that genuinely love the product that talked about it. And, you know, we never did the Gymshark model, which was all like the sort of huge influencers. We went for like the micro influencers, like with a few thousand followers that actually were more credible and genuine that could talk to people. And that that's what built the brand. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Very good. Andy, I think you had a question. Yep. Yeah, Julia. As you as you as you grew the business and grew the, the 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 number of staff that you had, how did you? What was the one big thing that you did that carried those staff with you in terms of mimicking or, or copying your your own enthusiasm or your uh, your, your emphasis on the brand? It's really difficult. I mean, I think the first sort of few hires, we do a lot with Branson and, you know, we've been part of like the Virgin Fast Track and, and Virgin Unite. And one of the things that he's always said is that culture is the most important thing. And, you know, when you interview somebody, you can tell like the ones or the twos, um, you know, because they're no good. Um, and you can also tell like the nine and the tens, like the superstars. It's like the sort of seven and eights that you're not sure about that actually could do the job, but you're just not sure about them as people. And you can train someone to do something, but you can't change them, nor should you. So I think getting that cultural fit was really, really important. And, you know, one of the first hires was a guy called Rob that still works at the business um, that didn't have any experience, but we just really liked him and he's grown within the business. But I think some of the most recent hires, you know, where they've come from organizations like maybe big corporates that can do the job, but actually they can't work in an SME, that that's been quite challenging. Um, but when we've had new people on board, we've always had like a sort of induction with them. So they've always had a meeting with myself and Al when I was in the business where we actually talked to them about the story and they sort of, they, they, they knew where the brand had come from because sometimes, you know, you employ people at the beginning and they realize the sort of struggle when you employ people to a higher paid job and they come in towards the end, they almost don't see what it's taken to get the business to where it is now. But we also introduced a unit share scheme. So basically, instead of giving people equity in the business, we encouraged them to stay in the business by giving them up to 100% of their salary as a bonus on an exit. So it wasn't giving away any equity. It wasn't giving any money because actually if they left, they didn't get anything. But it kept good staff in the business because people always try to pinch the staff because they know that they were really good. They work really hard. So by offering them this sort of unit share scheme, which is a potential bonus on an exit, that did keep good staff in the business. Okay, thank you. Very, very good. Um, anybody else? Yep, Lizzie. Hi, Juliet. I mean, it's such an incredibly inspiring story. It's just the practicalities of how do you stay grounded when you had so much going on? I mean, like literally sleeping at night and not working 48 hours a day. Um, I I didn't have a work-life balance. I'll be completely honest with yeah. you. I, I, we always, you know, the businesses I work with now, I just say, look, it's so important to have some time to yourselves, especially if you've got a family. But like, Al and I never had kids. So for the first yeah. year, four years, we didn't take a day off. We didn't take a salary for four years and everything went into the business. When we went on holiday, you know, we worked. And in hindsight, we probably should have had more of a work-life balance, but I genuinely don't think you can grow a business mm. if you think you're going to be able to have four or five holidays a year. You know, for us, it was really, really important that we were there. One of the big sort of mistakes maybe that we made was that work spilled into home. So we didn't have that cut off. Um, but again, I wouldn't change anything because I just absolutely loved it. And like, you know, we got to see some fantastic places and met some phenomenal people and it was all thanks to the business. So actually Grenade was our life and that sounds really sad now looking, yeah. but uh, yeah, I never really managed that work-life balance, I'm afraid. Yeah, no, I'm not expecting, to, you can't, I mean, you can't, but it was just how you physically, yeah, that's great, thank you. I just, yeah, I, yeah. Balls. I really really like to be busy so I can't relax like I can't watch a film because you know 10 minutes I'm like oh, I can't even go to the hairdresser because I'm like just I'll dry my own hair because it just takes too long so you I think you have to be, you can't be taught yeah. to be an entrepreneur you just are I think hmm. thank you at, at what point you mentioned was it Tom that you said you, you brought in that became oh, yeah what at what stage was the business when you brought him in uh, he was bought in in 2014, just after we had the um, investment from Grove Point. 
Um, and actually, again, it was one of those things where we were like, do we really need an FD? But, you know, Grove Point were adamant that we had one. And because Tom was so good, he was more than just an FD. So he was involved in the business. You know, he got the sales. He was great with customers. And now he's still in the business, but not in that FD capacity, but in that sort of sales director role. Because, again, he's got the numbers head, but he's also got like the sort of personality and, and can deal with, with customers, which is great. Hmm. So how many, how many people did you have at that at that point? When we had the first round of investment in 2014. Yeah. So yeah, it was Al and I, um, we had a girl that was like an office manager and we had a guy that was straight out of university. So there were four of us and then we brought on Tom. Yeah. Yeah. So quite, quite early in terms of the, the people. Yeah. So yeah. that's a, that's a, that's a good old valuation at uh, the four people how, without getting into any technical details, but, but how, how was that valuation uh, arrived at? What was it, what was it based on? Do you remember? We had a great profit margin, so we were like fifty percent on some of our products, and I think that was and because we didn't have that many products and we didn't have a, 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 a team, so I think we got nineteen times um, on that investment because it was really on wow. what we could earn, and they saw where the market was going. Um, and like you know, in sports nutrition, there have been some phenomenal investments. So I think Maxi Muscle got I don't know, was it twenty times. Um, so there were some big valuations because it was such a growing business, but we wouldn't get that valuation now because sports nutrition is, is very stagnant. It's more like the healthy snacking, you know, the sort of protein snacks that's actually giving the, the business the value. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Very good. And, and what, what's the next, next stage for, for, for Grenade? What's, uh, what's next? Um, I mean, like I said, I sort of stepped away day to day in um, sort of um, December 2018. But, you know, it's more geographies, it's sort of more products, you know, not necessarily more flavours, but still along that sort of healthy snacking space. And again, you know, we tried clothing, you know, that's doing OK, whether we'll do more of that. But it's about building the brands. So we're doing a lot more sort of experiential marketing. We're having some great collaborations with, you know, the guy, the Jetpack Man. And, you know, just really having fun with the brand now because we're at that point where we just need to keep consumers interest in the products yeah um, and we never set up grenade to make money because that isn't sort of a motivating factor you know everything i'm wearing today i think is free from like brands either grenade or you know i've never really been motivated by that so it was always about like loving the brand loving business and actually that's what floats our boat and i think that's why it's been so successful and we can do all this crazy marketing stuff because it isn't just about making money it's about that brand experience yeah yeah very good Right. Any any final final questions, Graham? As a as a branding marketing company, have you got any any comments or thoughts, questions for Julia? I haven't really got any questions for Julia. It's just a fantastic story from a in a ten year startup to where you are today. You know, a global business. It's an incredible story and taken a lot of hard work and. Uh, you mentioned that there were some mistakes that you probably in hindsight would have done it again, but I think you made a lot more successes than mistakes <laughs> over the last 10 years. Well done. Thank you. Yeah, very good. We've got um, a couple of other branding people. Philip, um, any thoughts from, from you? I, I, I obviously love the storytelling aspect of it. You know, um, I think um, sharing stories like you've just done, Julia, um, you know, throughout the, throughout the growth of the business, really. Um, I'm sure, you know, you've been able to share those type of stories as you progressed and all that. Um, and the stories about, you know, the people using the products and so on. And, you know, how that contributes to building up the brand and, you know, the, the loyalty to the brand. Just uh, people sharing their stories with each other. Yeah, very, very good. Um, Simon, did... did did I see you with a hand up earlier on? Did you have a question? No. Okay. And uh, and and Doug, you're also in. You're also obviously in the creative space. You're on mute again, though. <laughs> it's twice. Got you twice, Doug. You're still on mute. Yeah. Okay. Great. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's why I was interested in asking about the the social media side of things. So I mean, it's um. But yeah, um, really inspirational the way you've managed to, to grow that um, at the right time. And it, it, it's good that, you know, the area that we live in has so, so many successful um, companies like, like that, that that have the power. And 
and you know it, you know having that drive to be an entrepreneur really really helps you know it is great when you when you start to do that success you start to get those successes it's a really it's like a drug i think it sort of keeps driving you forward and making you do more so really interested to hear thank you very much julia thank you yeah, yeah. and lots of things i, I love now obviously it's a good business story but it's also a fantastic brand story i mean i love the idea the image you created of, of driving the tank into the nec and um and 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 the, and the obviously starting out with the packaging with the with the grenade shaped packaging you reminded me of um uh, <coughs> a, a, a mobile charging company or device company called juice um they, they, in, in in a way in a sim similar way you know they design their packaging uh, around the name they, and, and creating a, a carton of juice to look like the packaging for their for their, for their charges yeah, i work with juice <laughs> ah very good okay excellent so really 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 interesting you've left me with another great image which is big men in small pants so um so that was a that was a, that was a good one um but <laughs> <laughs> but but Julia, yes, thank thank you very much indeed for for coming on today. That's been really inspiring for us. And uh, can we can we give our usual round of Zoom applause for for, for Julia? Thank you very much. Thank you. Good. Thank you.